Close your left eye. Now I want you to look over to the left. What do you see? You weren't seeing it before I suggested it, were you? Why not? Tell, come and tell me, why not? Huh? You were looking beyond it? Well, you weren't really looking beyond it, because if you pay attention, you actually can see a faint shadow of it, especially me. <laughs> well, your brain doesn't think it's important, so it throws out that information. There's all kinds of information that your brain throws out, so I want you to do another experiment. I've got something against the left eye, so I want you to close it again. And this time, I want you to hold your hands out like this, and I want you to Take your right eye and look at your left index finger here. And I want you to notice something. The tip of your right index finger has disappeared. Now you can make it reappear by wiggling it. Now what happened to your right index finger? And no doctors in here get to answer the question, because you all know this. So someone who isn't a doctor, tell me what happened. Where did your finger go? All right, someone who is a doctor, tell me where your finger went. Oh my God. All right. So there's this thing called your optic nerve. And sometimes biology does really weird things. And one of the things it does, believe it or not, is that light actually goes through the neurons that carry light information to your brain. They're transparent. It hits your photoreceptors. And then the nerves turn around and go back and punch a hole in the back of your retina. And that thing is called your blind spot. You've got two of them. There's one here, and there's one here. You just found one with this finger. And so what is the lesson of that story? The lesson is that you not only have blind spots. So let me stop a moment. How many of you knew that you had the blind spot? Be honest. Eh, about half of you. And then that means the other half did not know. How could you go through your whole life and not know you had these two big, huge holes in your vision? Well, the answer is that your brain hides this information from you. It's not a crime of omission. It's a crime of commission. It actively hides the fact that it's giving you a blind spot because it thinks, like Jack Nicholson and a few good men, that you can't handle the truth. <laughs> and the truth is that you're blind to lots of things. Now, why am I going over this? Well, uh, we had a speaker this morning, Dr. Klein, who pointed out that it's not a good idea to just focus on errors. And I'm going to agree up to a point, but disagree in the following sense. That if you took a wax mold of your errors, what would the inverse of that be after you remove the wax mold? It would be the truth. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that looking at your errors actually is incredibly valuable because you know for a fact that opportunity lives in those erroneous zones in your brain that we also call the blind spots. So what I'm going to do this morning is talk about the blind spots that you have and how to find opportunities lurking in there. Because what if there was some unbelievable opportunity right here on your nose? You wouldn't see it because your brain erases your nose. What happens if there was a huge opportunity in your blind spot? You wouldn't see it. Now I'm going to do one more thing. I want you all to pay attention to your butts. OK? Feel the pressure of your weight on the chair. Now Einstein said, maybe the chair is pushing up on you, or maybe your butt is pushing down on it. Mathematically, it's the same. But what if there was an opportunity that you were sitting on? You wouldn't feel it either because you weren't paying attention, because your brain, in its infinite wisdom, knew that it didn't matter. Now, we're going to see why this is true in a moment. I'm going to tell why we have the brainstorm. I'm going to give you more examples. And then I'm going to help you with a positive note on how to find opportunities and threats. So let's uh, look at these drawings. They're about, um, oh, they're not seeing them. OK. There we go. So these are rock drawings from Africa, probably 20,000 years ago. Who can tell me something that all of these characters here have in common that's actually a true feature, as far as we know, of hunter-gatherers? Come on, I'm trying to get you into thinking mode here. So someone who was on a treadmill this morning, tell me. 
They're skinny. Our ancestors lived on a starvation diet. Right? They were right at the edge of dying from starvation. Now, how much energy does your brain use up of the total you consume every day? Anybody tell me this? Come on, some doctor, tell me this. It's 20%. And what happens when you think really, really hard? You use up energy. So guess what? Our brain doesn't like to do that. There is a term that cognitive psychologists called uh, uh, being a cognitive miser. And the reason is you've got to be fast and you've got to be frugal. You've got to react to this sort of thing. And the problem is that those were our brains back 200,000 years ago when we first evolved. That's what it looked like. And here's what it looks like today. Can anybody tell me the difference? There's no difference. You might be in your 30s or your 40s, but your brain is 200,000 years old. Yeah. And so what your brain does with its cognitive miserliness is it does fast and frugal. My dad was a rocket scientist who actually built real rockets that did things. In other words, he was very practical. And he said to me, Eric, as I started getting into my career in engineering, he said, the one thing you have to remember is best is the enemy of good enough. In other words, just do good enough. Now this rat here is just doing good enough. And that's exactly what your brain does. Now, that's pretty cool. You look at that and you go, oh, that's a smart rat, right? <laughs> but what if there were opportunity in the halls of one of those mazes? Would the rat have found it? No. So think about that picture. If you only hold one image in your mind, and Alan Kay, who I work with, he actually worked for me for about three years, which is kind of weird. It's kind of like Sherman and Peabody, right? He, was, he owned me versus the other way around. But he said to me, a picture is worth, he said, a word is worth one thousandth of a picture. So if you don't remember anything else, that's what your brain does. Without you knowing it, it's unconscious to preserve energy and to be fast, fast and frugal. And opportunities live here, and you have no clue that they're there. All right, so blind spot number one, expectation. I want you to count the Fs in this statement. How many do you see? Come on, quick. Fast and frugal. Three? Yeah, there are six. And what you overlooked was the Fs and of. The Fs and of are like your nose. It doesn't matter. Forget it. You know, I was called in. He didn't tell you that I was the chief technology officer of the U.S. intelligence community. And I used to go, we called downrange to Iraq and places like that. And we were looking for this bad guy called Zarqawi. Some of you may remember him. Uh, he was ISIS before ISIS was cool. <laughs> and I was talking to the CIA guys, and uh, I, I said, I went over some of these things with them, and I said, where don't you expect him to be? I showed him this Fs and of thing, and I said, you know, I'll bet he's hiding in one of the Fs of of. Turned out, he was. And he's no longer with us. We introduced him to paradise early. Um, so, you know, uh, the point is that we look at the future, we look through the windshield, but what are we really looking at? And this has to do with the way the brain works. I want you to now close your eyes. Close them. Ah, you go over there, you got yours open, close them. All right. Imagine a color you have never seen before. Can't do it, can you? Okay, you can open your eyes now. Why? Why can't you imagine a color you've never seen before? Because perception is not a passive thing. Perception is an active thing. It's the act of actually creating something, which is the act of perception. We call this analysis by synthesis. And if you cannot find building blocks of a thing, you cannot imagine it. And so this is why it's extremely hard to see things that we don't expect. When I was in the aerospace business, uh, we heard about the Berlin Wall today. This is when the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, I was a manager in the business, and I was projecting our earnings to be this. I ended up at Disney a year later. It wasn't voluntary. That was one of those mistakes that uh, senior managers don't like. So the point I'm trying to make is that there are huge blind spots, and this is actually the most important blind spot that we have. We see what we expect to see. It's called a match filter. And we don't see what we don't expect to see. For example, Here's coffee beans. Does anybody see the human bean in here? 
Now, I don't know about you, but I, I use coffee greens and ground them, but I don't think I've ever seen a human head in my coffee beans. I don't think I want to. They don't taste very good. All right. At least I don't think so. So let me give you some examples of how to overcome expectation blindness. With apologies to Dr. Klein, because he's probably seen this a zillion times, I want you to all help me with an experiment. You're in a room, and there's a rope hanging from the ceiling, and all that you've got is a pair of pliers, and your job is to get the end of this rope to hit one wall and then the other, or touch one wall and then the other, but you can't grab the rope. How do you do it? Come on. Pliers? How? How do the pliers? Right. You use it as a pendulum. You tie the end of the pliers uh, around the end of the rope, and you go whap, and it bounces off one wall and hits the other. What's the key to solving that problem? It's not looking at them as pliers, but looking at them as a weight. So you saw Apollo 13, I hope. That's what they did with all that stuff to do the rebreather. SMS texting was a back channel system that these engineers said, maybe we could do instant messaging with that. And then there was this drug that uh, countered cyclic AMP, and they found out that it was a, you know, a heart drug for blood pressure and everything. And uh, they found that the male uh, subjects in the experiment, when the phase one safety trials were over, wouldn't return the, the samples. <laughs> That led to a discovery. I don't know which of the three of Dr. Klein's that is. It's probably desperation. I think that was the one. Um, but that, that enough said. Okay, here's some other examples. Here's using, a lot of you have used your phone as a flashlight. I love this, turning a toaster into a toaster oven to make grilled cheese sandwich. I mean, that one, talk about simple. You said this morning, Mark, that uh, simple, you knew simple. That is simple, that's simple too. You take your sunglasses and put them here. You use a fan for a leaf blower. And here's my all-time favorite. <coughs> now, how many of you think that a guy did that? I'd say the probability was vanishingly close to one. But, yeah. And I don't mean to sound sexist, but that, that's like a male solution. And you know, if you look at this, it's also cutting edge innovation. OK. Okay, um, now we heard about Kodak earlier today. I used to work with Kodak when I was at Disney. We used a lot of their products. And we used to beat on them and talk about digital. And they said, oh, you know. And you know, I have a slightly different, uh, there is uh, corporate inertia. And uh, Dr. Klein was absolutely right about that. But there was another thing about Kodak. Um, they didn't want to believe that digital was going to eat their lunch. You know, uh, Upton Sinclair said, you cannot convince a man of something that his job depends on not understanding. And that's what happened at Kodak. And uh, how many of you remember Ken Olson from Digital? A $13 billion company in 1989, which today would be about 30 billion. It would definitely be in the Fortune 100, except they don't exist anymore. Because Ken Olson said, ah, no one ever want a personal computer. He didn't want to believe it. Well, he's gone. Now, here's another example. I, I want to give you hope. I want to look at the inspirational thing. You know, Bill Gates gets a lot of crap for being Bill Gates. But I think he's one of the greatest leaders that ever lived for this reason. In the mid-1990s, these guys dominated the desktop, right? What was happening then, though? What did he see coming up on the horizon that could really throw a monkey wrench into Microsoft's progress? It was the internet. They didn't dominate that. But he got it. He didn't want to believe it, but he did embrace it. So in one of the most amazing pivots in corporate history, he slammed on the brakes, took a hard right turn, and internetified every single thing that Microsoft did immediately. Why was that great? Good leaders change in smart ways when it's obvious you have to. Great leaders change before they have to. And that's what he did. You should do it too. By the way, how many in here consider yourself applied biologists? You all are. You're doctors. You're in healthcare. You're applied biologists for, you know, all right? What does biology do? How come biology succeeds when the earth has changed in cataclysmic ways? There was snowball earth. There was the thing that wiped out the dinosaurs. Biology changes before it has to change. That's why all of us are here. OK, blind spot, tunnel vision. We kind of only see what we're looking at. 
So here we're looking at beautiful flowers, but we missed something here. This could be an opportunity or threat. I don't know if you can see this. This is a tiger about to eat you. Um, and so this is a problem. Let me give you some examples. Does anybody know what this is? I'm probably the oldest person in this room, but I remember these. They cost $6,000 when they came out in the 60s. Do you know what they were? I don't know if you know what that is. That's a calculator. Uh, it was a real innovation in those days, and it was going to replace this thing. Now, Kiefel and Esser, I was on the math team in high school, and we used to have leather holsters for our... <laughs> and I hit another math geek. Yeah, Frank is going like that, and we go, draw, and we do a double logarithm. And who could do it fastest would win. Um, but these things here, the guys who ran this saw this, but they had tunnel vision trying to do ones for space and orbital mechanics. And so they didn't do very well. Now, I'm part of the Disney Accelerator. I'm a contractor there. And what they're doing is they know that they're this. Someone asked, what do you do if you're a big corporation? Well, what Disney has done is they realize they can't really overcome their own inertia, so they don't try. What they do is they invest in startups 10 every year, and they know that they need fresh DNA all the time because they don't know what they don't know, and so they get people who do know what they don't know, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, change blindness. Can anybody see the difference between these two photographs? Oh, that's, yeah, but there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, I have my slides here. You can look at them at your leisure. There's a lot more in there. So, yeah, we don't see changes, really, if they're not significant or our brain doesn't think they are. And here's the problem. Remember the railroads? They used to dominate long-distance transportation. Well, do they anymore? They haul freight, and they haul you up and down the Eastern Corridor to New York and Boston, but that's about it, really. Uh, why? What business were they in in the 1940s? Well, they thought they were in the railroad business. Problem was, they were in the transportation business. So someone who did transportation better than them was going to eat their lunch. Or in the parlance of, who moved my cheese, their cheese moved and they didn't realize it. They were change blind. On the other hand, you had Ethan Allen. What business were they in? Home furniture. No. Because where was furniture being made and sold? Not in the US anymore. A lot cheaper to get it somewhere else. They realized that their cheese had moved, so they shifted. They fired a bunch of people who knew about furniture, and they hired a zillion interior designers because they defined their business as making beautiful homes. Making beautiful homes, not selling furniture. So they did a pivot, and they're still around. A lot of furniture companies aren't. Uh, there's another thing. It's the subject of my book, Long Fuse, Big Bang. There's a, a thing called temporal myopia. Some of you have studied neuroeconomics, and you know this thing about hyperbolic discounting. OK, how many of you have teenagers? or young kids. Say, if you went to them and you said, here's the deal, I'm going to give you $10 right now, or tomorrow I'm going to give you $11. What would they do? Right now. Okay. Now if you went to them and you said, I'm going to give you $10 in 30 days, or $11 in 31 days, what would they do? They'd take the $11 in 31 days. What's the difference between 30 days and 31 days? Well, you know what the implied discount rate is? It's about a zillion percent. It's well over a thousand percent. I think the inflation is not quite that high. But our brains think it is. And so we call this temporal myopia. We see a big now. Uh, now here's a problem. Blockbuster kind of knew the internet was coming. Right? They saw this. This is Amazon's very first website. Uh, they didn't do so good. I don't know about you, but Blockbuster, yeah, that's not where I get my movies. On the other hand, this guy, Alan Kay, who, he is one of my heroes. He's, he's a great guy. He came up with this thing called the Dynabook in 1969 as his original patent. It was a flat screen display, originally designed for kids. He had a vision, and you know, you know, I can't do this right now. So he and a bunch of others at Apple did this thing called the Apple Newton, which is the first handheld computer, right? I don't know, maybe some of you remember it. But they had a vision that they were going to create a long fuse to a big bang by a series of firecrackers that each paid off. And so they had this, you know, and then when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, he said, well, we learned a lot from this. We've got to make it a lot simpler and make it do just one thing and not call it a computer. We'll call it a music player. And then they took this, quote, music player and they added images. Then they added a phone. Then they added iPad and boom. So they did a long fuse to a big bang. They got around this future blindness. There's another way I put this. If you want to sell a big idea, make it look as small as the mind that must approve it.
Here's another one. Sunk cost blindness. I apologize for this a little bit graphic image. You can kind of see the point. That leaders tend to say, well, I put all this much money into it. And, you know, Bethlehem Steel, they had invested hundreds of billions of dollars in their steel infrastructure. Well, guess what? Many mills came along and wiped them out. Uh, so you know, they were dinosaur. They're gone, basically. These guys, however, Lou Gerstner in his book, uh, So You Think Elephants Can't Dance, a great book I would urge you to read, he realized that there was no profit anymore in making computers, so he did a pivot and turned IBM into a service business to help people take advantage of IT, not to sell them IT. And IBM thrived as a result. They did not, they were not wedded to the anchor of their suck cost. Bandwagon blindness. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Gartner's hype curve. You know, what, somebody tell me what's all the hype and rage today out there in the tech world. Augmented reality, virtual reality, right? Well, according to them, you know, what happens with those things is that's at the peak of the hype curve. It's going to crash, and then maybe 10 years from now, it's going to be something big. Um, but a lot of people follow the bandwagon. The internet bubble was an example of this. Housing bubbles were another example of that. Uh, but you don't have to do that. Uh, can anybody tell me who this singing group is? Big girls don't cry. Come on. <laughs> hey, I got a real career in singing, don't I? It's the uh, Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. What happened in the early 60s in music in the US? It was the British Invasion, the Beatles, the Stones, the Dave Clark Five, the Kinks. And so every American group was going, oh, we got to be like the British. We got to do those harmonies like the Beatles does, blah, 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 blah. These guys said, no, we're from Jersey. We're going to do it our way. We ain't changing nothing. And now there's a Broadway show about them but not the Knickerbockers. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the Knickerbockers. They kind of sounded like the Beatles. They had a one-hit wonder called Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. <laughs> Tribal blindness. Now, I'm going to tell you a contradiction. Uh, I think it was Dale Carnegie said, the mark of a mature mind is one that can hold two contradictory thoughts in their head at once. So here are two contradictory thoughts. Not invented here. Any of you seen this? An idea comes in from the outside and you go, eh, it's not our thing, go away. So that happens. And a good example is Northrop came up with this unbelievable jet fighter that was like, you know, really cheap and really, really good. It was best as the enemy good enough, but it wasn't the tribe's idea in Washington, so they killed it. Uh, Kodak had that problem too. Uh, but on the other hand, Top Coder is this fabulous software organization where they don't care, they're, they're a company, and what they do is they get any programmer, they give them a challenge, the one that wins, they put up on the website, and you want to hire a programmer to do something, you just look at who won the challenge to do that. It's going and getting other people's DNA to solve your problem. But there's the converse of that, and here's the contradiction. And this is what I noticed, that even though there's a not invented here, the CEO of most organizations, for example, doesn't really value his captive people as much as he does some expert on the outside. And thank God, because that's how I make my living. <laughs> I'm an outside expert. And I come in and say, oh, your people, you know, they're just not really innovative. You know, I'm this dizzy imagineer. I'm a PhD in neuroscience. I know how the brain works. Pay me lots of money. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, I'll be handing out my business cards. Um, just kidding. I actually didn't bring it. Um, but here's the thing. We tend to value experts. You know, uh, at Intel, we talked about Intel. There's a CEO, Pat Gelsinger. Well, I went up to see Andy Grove with Michael Eisner. I was his kind of top geek. You know, he had to have one or two of us because uh, technology mattered a little bit in entertainment. And so we realized that Hollywood and Silicon Valley were on a collision course. So Michael Eisner goes up to see Andy Grove, and we have this big summit meeting. And I take Pat Gelsinger aside, who was my counterpart. He was Intel CTO. And I said, Pat, does Andy Grove listen to you? No. I said, Michael doesn't listen to me either. I said, here's what we're going to do. What do you want Andy Grove to know? He told me. I said, here's what I want Michael Eisner to know. So he told Michael Eisner what I wanted to know, and I told Andy Grove what he wanted him to know. And it worked. <laughs> really sneaky. And the horrible things they make us do. But that's how, to, that's how to cure fresh gene blind spot.